为了把你把我给干掉了。那就是我不知道就不行，那就是我没有享受到，我应该可能就这个人也会心动，或者比较喜欢，他就比较，他那个定义是，就是他就比较大，他不是把你看成就让你跟我玩是吧？对对，你正好在。Textbooks. I've been going and and reading all these uh, papers in the original, in which all of these great algorithms, Dijkstra's and so on, and the algorithm for max flow were or originally produced. And so, I just wanted to mention one thing. Um, one of you, I think it was you, was it you, asked me. So, why is it a good idea to increase the flow along the shortest path? In max flow. So remember, you know, the Ford Fulkerson algorithm just says, here's a way to tell if there is any way to improve your current flow. Check to see if there is a path through the residual graph. And then if there is one, well, you can improve your flow by adding flow along it. But it doesn't really say which path you should use. And it also doesn't quite guarantee polynomial time. In the case where the capacities are n-digit numbers and so can be exponentially large, so one of the homework problems was um, what is commonly known now as, as the edmonds karp algorithm is, uh, and maybe some of you found this out in the course of looking at the homework. Um, if you always use the shortest path, shortest in terms of the number of links, then you can guarantee that. Uh, You will find the maximum flow within only a polynomial number of improvements. <coughs> so another intuitive idea is to use the fattest path. So the idea here is that if here's my current residual graph, the graph of what of unused capacity that I still have in the network, it might be that、um, here is a path where the bottleneck on it. Has width two. In other words, the the minimal capacity along any along its edges is two, which means I can increase the flow by two along it. Here's here's a shorter path, but along this path I can only increase the flow by one. So the shortest path method would say use this one. The fattest path method would say use that one. So it turns out that the fattest path method、um, 
we'll find the maximum flow in at most m times the, get this, natural log of f max steps, where f max is the value of the maximal flow. <clears throat> and this is good, right? Because the flow could be exponentially large, but its log is only polynomial, mm -hmm. right? I mean, at most, this is the sum of all of the capacities. And if, the, if those are all n-digit numbers, then f max is at most some n-digit numbers. This is like m times n. And this is also polynomial. And the proof of this is, if anything, shorter and sweeter than the proof that the shortest path method works. And uh, you know, so we've already sort of moved on to NP completeness. But I just wanted to toss this at you. Um, the thing is that you know, you've all these algorithms books out there like CLRS, you know, this 1,200-page monstrosity, and you know, people use it in algorithms classes mainly because of inertia. After all, the book itself is considerable inertia. <laughs> and you know, but it, it makes some terrible choices. I mean, so there are some really beautiful algorithmic ideas which have largely been lost in the mists of time because the textbook writers haven't, didn't choose to put them in the textbooks and because most people learn this only through the textbooks. So things are only remembered insofar as the textbooks remember them. So um, <coughs> anyway, this, this is very nice. If anyone wants to see the proof, you know, come, come to my office hours or I'll send it to you. What's M? M is, I'm sorry, M is the number of edges in the graph. And F, which is also, that's polynomial. And F is the value of the maximal flow. And the fact that this logarithm here, maybe you're nervous that, oh my gosh, there must be some really weird, tricky math underneath this. Actually, there isn't at all. Um, you can derive this from the following fact that, so each step, uh, Let's look at how far we currently are from the maximal flow. <clears throat> so here's f max minus f. This is how far we have yet to go. <coughs> OK. So um, each step reduces this by this factor, 1 minus 1 over m or better. Another way to put this is, maybe a nicer way to put this is, Here's the flow you have left to discover. Each step improves matters by at least 1 over m of that. So that how far you have left to go goes down to 1 minus 1 over m of how far you had before. But that means that things sort of go down geometrically by this guaranteed ratio. And do a little math, and you'll get this log. Um, because that's the number of steps in the geometric series you need to get. So, I mean, we also assume here that the capacities are integers. So we know that that very last improvement is at least 1. And so once, you, once your improvements get down that far, then you're done. See if you can derive this from that. Um, OK. And you might find the following <coughs> thing useful, that minus log of 1 minus 1 over m is greater than or equal to 1 over m, which is something you should know from Taylor series and calculus. It's this plus this squared over 2 plus higher order terms. Um, excuse me? Yes? Is in, I mean, the shortest path. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the shortest path, big O and Q, I mean, the time. We have proving that have what, right? Oh, well, the total amount of time. OK. So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, the thing is that each step of Ford Fulkerson can be done in polynomial time. So oh, if we're not worrying too much about getting all the factors of n right in the total running time, <laughs> then we're free to ask, how many, how many times do we increase the path? How many times do we apply the Ford Fulkerson idea of finding a path and increasing the flow along it somehow? Um, good. <clears throat> uh, all right. So we've talked 
a lot about various problems in NP. Um, so we're near the end now of chapter four, which is one of the shorter chapters. And um, I think it's important for your classical education to see what I'm going to show you today. Of course, all professors think that. Um, but what I'm going to show you is something called the Pratt Certificate, I'll call it the Pratt Witness for Primality. So here's the question. So the property of non-primality, remember, is in NP. Because the witness that proves that a number isn't prime is any one of its divisors, or two things that multiplied together give it. Okay? So it's easy to come up with a witness for non-primality. Now again, keep in mind, we're not dealing with here, here with the, how hard it is to find those numbers. That's the factoring problem. We think it's hard. We're just dealing with the fact that there exists a witness, which again, if a friend comes down from the clouds and shows it to you, you can check it. Finding this proof, this pair of numbers, A and B, such that A times B equals P, finding that proof might be hard, but checking it is easy. And that's all that NP as a class demands, that there's a proof that you can check easily. All right? So non-primality is in NP. So is primality. So again, let, let's be precise about this. So let P be an n-digit number, or n-bit number, I don't care. If P is prime, is there a witness, also known as a proof of that fact of, first of all, it has to be only polynomially long, or we don't, we can't, don't even have time to read it in polynomial time. <coughs> and then we, mere mortals that we are, maybe we can't find the proof, but we can check it, which we can check in polynomial in n time. And it's really not obvious what this witness would look like. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing it cannot be is an exhaustive search in which we divide p by all the, number, all the smaller numbers, or even up to, say, square root of p, because after all, if p has n digits, how many digits does square root of p have? n over 2. n over 2. And so even square root of p is you know, 2 to the n over 2, and that's still exponentially large. Yeah. Okay? So even if I handed you a table of p divided by x for all x up to square root p, I mean, it would be a silly thing to do, because it's going to take you exponential time to read it. And each individual thing I handed you, you could have done yourself anyway. Okay, so that's not an efficient proof. It's not a polynomial size witness or a polynomial time checkable witness. So what might be one? And, you know, um, why should I show you this? Well, first of all, primality is one of the grand problems that people have been thinking about for thousands of years. So it's one of the places where we computer scientists can say that we're studying something which is more than 60 years old. We're really gaining some algorithmic understanding of, one of, of a very deep mathematical problem. I don't know if that does it for you, it does it for me. Um, but another reason is that the tools we're going to use here will introduce us to a little bit of number theory. And if you want to understand anything having to do with cryptography, if you want to know about RSA public key cryptography, which I know some of you already do, if you want to know how Diffie-Hellman key exchange works, which is how um, conversations get encrypted in Skype, um, you know, if you want to know any of these things, you need to learn a little bit about primes and number theory. So this will, this will give us some of these basic tools. Um, and 
I would be very pleased if before or after today's lecture you would read section 4.4 because um, I really want to know whether it is readable. Um, okay. And hopefully you can tell me during class today whether this lecture is audible and understandable. So, um, okay, so here's the idea. So we're going to use something called Fermat's Little Theorem, which, as you can tell from its name, is a couple of hundred years old. And it says this. If P is prime, then for all A, A raised to the P minus 1 is equivalent mod P to 1. How many of you already knew this? All right. So, um, I mean, for instance, suppose P is 5. We're saying that if you take anything and raise it to the fourth power, that mod 5 it will be equivalent to 1. 2 to the fourth is 16. Mod 5 is 1. 3 to the fourth is 81. Mod 5 is 1. And so on. All right. <coughs> so that's a nice fact. Now, um, another piece of uh, terminology we're going to need is that A is a primitive root, a more modern term for it would be a generator, but you, you'll, you'll see both terms if you poke around. If um, P minus 1 is the smallest number r such that a to the r is equivalent to 1 mod p. And another way to say this is that um, the powers of p, uh, sorry, the powers of a, 1, a, a squared, and so on, all taken mod p, that this includes the entire set of non-zero integers mod p. Okay, that it hits all of them. Um, uh, this set is often called zp star. Not sure if I'll need to call it that today, but that's what it's often called. It's the integers mod p under multiplication, so that's why we don't include zero. So for example, suppose p is 7. Well, if I set a equal to 2, it turns out that this is not a primitive root. So here are the powers of 2 mod 7, 1, 2, 4. Oh, but 8 is 1. So the powers of 2 mod 7 cycle around like this every three times. OK. Whereas the powers of 3 mod 7, here's 1, here's 3, 9 mod 7 is 2. Multiply that by 3, you get 27 mod 7, which is 6. Multiply that by 3, you get 81 mod 7, which is um, 4. Multiply that by 3, you get 5. And now, finally, 5 times 3 is 15, which is 1. So in this case, the powers of 3 hit all of the integers, all of the non-zero integers mod 7. So 3 is a primitive root. All right? <coughs> so um, this number here, R, the smallest power of A that gives you 1 mod P. This is called the order of A. So yet another way to say primitive root is a number whose order is P minus 1. Okay. So the, that means as you take its powers, you don't cycle back around to 1 until you get to the P minus first power. P minus 1. All right? Too fast? Comfortable? Never seen it before? Bewildered? 
seen it in high school, then forgot it. <laughs> Shall I proceed? <clears throat> no? Yes. More examples? Um, is it clear how I got these things? Well, I mean, so to, I mean, this is 1, 3, 9, 27, 81, uh, 243. Um, these are the powers of 3, these are the powers of 3 mod 7, but you don't have to keep taking this mod 7. You can take this mod, multiply it by 3, and take the result mod 7, right? Because mod works nicely that way. <coughs> so that's how I got these things. 6 times 3 is 18, 18 mod 7 is 18 minus 14, which is 4. Yeah. All right, so here's the idea. A primitive root, A, and, and by the way, I mean, A, a is a primitive root for P, right? This depends on what P is. So for instance, if P is 5, now 2 is a primitive root because the powers of 2 go 1, 2, 4, 8 mod 5 is 3, and now 16 mod 5 is 1, and this is all four of the integers from 1 to 4. Okay, so different primes of different primitive roots. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the idea is that a primitive root A is a witness. that P is prime. Because in fact, um, so there, because of, of the following if and only if, okay? So we've shown one direction. If P is prime, then for all A, um, this is true. But we can say more strongly, so there's the following theorem. Um, if P is not prime, then um, uh, let's see. If P is not prime, then every A has order less than P minus 1. Okay. So there are no primitive roots. If P is prime, there is at least one A with order P minus 1. So remember, when I say that the order is p minus 1, I don't just mean that a to the p minus 1 is equivalent to 1. I mean that that's the, that's the lowest power of a, which is equivalent to 1. Okay. So another way to phrase a primitive root is something with order p minus 1. All right. So I mean, the... the and I, I'm not going to prove this theorem um, unless someone asks me to. It's not too hard. But it's true. So if I can show you a if I can show you a primitive root and prove to you that it's a primitive root, I've proved to you that P is prime. All right. Well, If I show you A, okay, so remember, P is a thousand digit number. So it's roughly two to the thousand or 10 to the thousand. Um, if I show you A, can you confirm in polynomial time that A to the P minus one mod P equals one? We already talked about this problem. So oh, this yeah. is the modular exponentiation problem. And even though P is exponentially large, we can calculate this very high power of A 
in polynomial time by squaring a over and over again, um, getting you know a squared a to the fourth, a to the eighth, a to the sixteenth. Um, in polynomial time, we can get up to some power of two. If we do this for several different powers of two, then we can multiply the results together and then get a to the p minus one. Should I review that, or is that already? That's clear. Okay. So, um, all right. So we can check this, but this doesn't prove that a is a primitive root. So here's the witness, and here's what we check. Okay. So first, you come down from the clouds and give me a. You say, here is the primitive root a. And I say, oh, good. Um, hold on. Let me just check that a to the p minus 1 is equivalent to 1. Good. OK. But this doesn't prove that it's a primitive root, because how do I know that this is the smallest power? <coughs> well, um, one thing I can't do is check a to the t for all t less than p minus 1. Why can't I do that? There are exponentially many of them, because p is exponentially large. Okay. So that would take me exponential time. Well, but that turns out to be quite wasteful. So what do I know about the order of a if I know that a to the p minus 1 is 1? Does anybody happen to know this? So I claim that we know <coughs> that the order of A, R, whatever it is, divides P minus 1. Because, you know, let's say P minus 1 is some multiple of R, then a to the p minus 1 is a to the r, which is 1, raised to the k, which is 1. Right? Mm -hmm. If I take a to the r and raise it to a higher power, I'm going get, to still get 1. I'll get 1 to the k. Yep. And I claim this is, you know, it's an if and only if. All right. Okay, well, this is good. Now I don't need to check all the possible powers less than p minus 1. I just need to check all of the things which are divisors of it. This, yeah. Okay. Well, that's good news. That cuts down my work a lot. So I want to check that um, a to the t for all divisors t of p minus 1. I want to check that this is not equivalent. <coughs> well, this sounds good. The only problem is that p minus 1 can have a lot of divisors. Okay. It's kind of not obvious how many divisors it might have. But bad news. <coughs> If P has n digits, it can have, um, you know, a super polynomial number of divisors. <coughs> this this situation is a little bit rare. It happens when p minus 1 has lots of little prime divisors, but it can be the case. So rats. I mean, we seem to have gotten a lot closer. I think, um, let's see, specifically uh, the number of divisors, in case you're interested, um, can be, <coughs> you can actually have about 2 to the n over log n. Well, that's exponentially big. Mm -hmm. OK, darn. Well, 
Well, maybe we don't have to check all of the divisors, though. So I claim that all we have to do, instead of this, let's just do it for, I mean, every divisor is of p minus 1 is p minus 1 divided by something. <laughs> but I claim we only have to check p minus 1 divided once by each of its prime factors. Why is this? <coughs> because the other are just it composite. It's prime, yeah. it's prime that it has one. Exactly. I mean, writing this out may or may not help, but let's write it out. So the point is that let's say that R is P minus 1 over something, S. Okay. Well, and let's say that S is something t times some prime q. Well then, a to the p minus 1 over q equals a to the p minus 1 over tq raised to the t, which is um, a to the r to the t, which is 1 to the t, which is 1. Okay. I'm just saying what they said. Okay. Well, this is good because while you can have a whole heck of a lot of divisors, you cannot have that many different prime divisors. Okay. <coughs> if p if p minus one has n digits. Uh, let me just put it this way. <coughs> For any x, x has fewer than log base 2 of x <coughs> different prime <coughs> divisors, q. So in particular, if x is p minus 1, and this has n digits, then p minus 1 has only order n different prime divisors. Finally, now we're in business. Almost. Not yet. I mean, this is good. So, so first of all, shall we prove this? This isn't so hard to prove. Does anybody already see why this is true? <coughs> you know, so like 12 is 2 squared times 3. So it only has two different prime divisors, 2 and 3. Shall we prove this? It's easy. So let's say that you have um, d prime divisors, different ones. Well, obviously, the smallest u could be is the product of the first d different primes, right? Mm -hmm. so this means that x is at least as big as 2 times 3 times 5 times 7, da, 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 up to whatever the d prime is. But all of these are bigger than or equal to 2. So this is bigger than 2 to the d. So if you have d different divisors, d, d different prime divisors, <coughs> then you're at least as big as 2 to the d. So solving for d, there are less than log base 2 of x divisors, different prime divisors in x. Good. So now we only have order n different things that we need to check. <coughs> so for each prime divisor q of p minus 1, 
check that a to the p minus 1 over q. Again, do modular exponentiation mod p and confirm that it isn't 1. But something's wrong with our clever plan. What's wrong? You give me a, I say, oh, yeah, let's check. Oh, OK, good, a to the p minus 1 is 1. And oh, let's see, I just need to check all the prime divisors q of p minus 1. Getting the prime divisors is both. And <coughs> how, how do you know what they are? I don't know them. If I could factor p minus 1, but I don't know how to factor in polynomial time. Exactly. So, my friend up there on the cloud says, have you checked it yet? Does it work? And I say, I I I'm stuck. I don't know the prime divisors of p minus 1. So my friend says, OK, we'll add those to the certificate. In addition to A, here we have a list of primes, q1 up through q, I don't know, j. And I tell you how many times each one appears. So my friend gives me the prime factorization of p minus 1. And now I know all the primes in p minus 1. And now I check this. And I say, OK, great, that was fun. And I go home and I something starts to bother me. What if my friend wasn't being entirely honest? <laughs> After all, this really needs to be a proof. And I, so, you know, I can't just go ahead and trust him. So I can certainly check to see that this product equals p minus 1, but why is that maybe not quite enough? You have to know it's all primes. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So he says, oh, here, here's a bunch of big primes, and these are the primes appearing in p minus 1's factorization. I say, well, I don't wish to be rude, but could you prove to me that those are prime? <coughs> and how is he going to do that? Recursively. <laughs> Recursively. Start the whole thing all over. Do the same kind of certificate for each of these cues that he was giving me for p in the first place, which will involve the prime factorization of q minus 1 for each of these cues. And he does those as well, and so on. And as a matter, you know, so you might worry that this thing will never end. But the good news is that these primes are noticeably smaller than p because their product equals p, so fewer digits. And you do all the recursion. And I'm not going to prove this because this is the part that, even without knowing any number theory, you should be able to prove. It turns out that the total length of this entire circuit, uh, sorry, entire certificate, entire witness, even including all this recursion all the way down to where the primes in question are 2. And I say, OK, I, I know 2 is prime. You don't have to prove it. That's the base case. This whole thing takes about n squared bits for an n-digit number. I think that's pretty keen. <coughs> so, um, OK. So there is a polynomial, polynomial length witness. And I can do all the checking in polynomial time. We have to show that, too. We have to recursively show that the total amount of time I spend proving that all these primes are prime um, is still polynomial. And it is. Isn't this cute? I think this is very cute. There are somewhat shorter certificates, but they involve yet fancier math that I don't know. And um, anyway, so this proves, um, and I should say, and can be checked <coughs> in total time, which is polynomial in n. 
And this proves that primality, the question whose answer is yes if a number is prime, is in NP. <coughs> Alrighty. Well, you might think, oh, well, this is a, this is a, I could use this as an algorithm. After all, if there exists a witness of a certain length, I can search. Rather than having my friend come from on high, I can search through all possible witnesses that my friend could claim. And then just as soon as I find the one that works, I know that P is prime. But does that give a polynomial time algorithm? How many possible witnesses are there whose length is n squared bits? Two to the n squared. Two to the n squared. So yeah, actually, that's a terrible algorithm. So you know, without wanting to delve further into the details, I hope the high-level structure of this result is clear. Um, any questions about that or anything else? Yes. So um, to assert that, I guess, the composite factors of p minus 1 don't give us any more information than we would get just knowing the prime factors. Right. Okay. So if, if any smaller power of a is 1, <laughs> it's something which divides p minus 1. But in between it and p minus 1 is p minus 1 divided by a prime. And it divides that too. So if this were 1, then that would be 1. So we just need to check p minus 1 divided by all the primes. <clears throat> All right. So, by the way, where does this locate um, primality? So here's P. Here's NP, which is the class of problems where if the answer is yes, there's a simple proof of that fact. Here's co-NP, which is the class of problems where if the answer is no, there is a simple proof of that fact. What we know so far is that primality is in the intersection of NP and co-NP. As a matter of fact, it turns out to be in P. Um, so I mentioned at the very end of last time that, I mean, of course, we don't know. I notice that, so what is co-P? Co-P is P. Co-P is P, because take your algorithm and just switch the answers yes and no. So if there was an efficient algorithm before, there's an efficient algorithm now. So it's entirely possible. I mean, if P equals NP, then P also equals co-NP, and this whole thing collapses down. <coughs> but we believe that we believe several things. In addition to believing that P is smaller than NP, we also believe that co-NP and NP are different. Okay? We believe that having a simple proof in the case where the answer is yes is very different from having a simple proof in the case where the answer is no. And in particular, we believe, let's take a problem like Hamiltonian path, we believe that there is no simple proof, that there isn't a Hamiltonian path, if there isn't. Even though there is a kind of obvious simple proof that there is, if there is, namely, show it to me. Finally, we also believe that NP intersect co-NP is bigger than P. In other words, we believe that there are properties in here, even though primality is now known to be in P. We believe that there are properties where if the answer is yes, you can prove it to me. If the answer is no, you can prove it to me. But that in both cases, I need someone much powerful than I am to come down from on high and show me the proof. That it's not something I can find efficiently myself. Um, okay. <clears throat> Good. So, um, just because it's a cute problem, and let's finish up chapter four and talk about knots. So we started talking about this last time. And um, I think it's really marvelous that this problem is still as poorly understood as it is. I mean, it's really quite poorly understood. Um, 
And it's one of those problems that you can explain to anybody. So that makes it kind of more fun that we don't totally understand it. Um, so, excuse me here. Um, Sorry, which were you talking about that's poorly understood? Knots. Okay. So, um, so again, I have a, a knot diagram, right? So there are lots of ways to give, to give you a nice discrete <coughs> computational finite number of bits description of a knot. So one of them is I could draw it like this. So I could give you a description of a planar graph where each vertex has degree four. And at each vertex, I could tell you which two edges are over and which two are under. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is um, kind of a more computational geometry type of setup, where I give you a sequence of points in three-dimensional space. Um, and then the lines in between them describe a knot. Okay, so either of these are ways to express knots, to email you a knot in a way that you and your algorithms could go to work on it. Um, it doesn't really matter very much which one we use. But um, let's say that n is the number of crossings. So it's the number of vertices in this diagram. So there are lots of interesting questions we can ask about knots. So of course, one is that um, the number of crossings in the version that I show you could be much greater than the smallest possible number of crossings. There might be a much simpler expression of a knot which is topologically the same. And we don't need to talk about formal topology. You know what I mean. It's a string. You're not allowed to cut it or glue it. Okay. So there, it turns out that there is a finite list of moves called the Riedemeister moves, um, all of which are pretty intuitive. And here they are. One is that you can change this into that. Just pull that loop tight. Another is that you can change this into this, just pull one of those across the other, pretty obvious. And maybe the only one which is not totally obvious um, looks like this. If you do <coughs> this and then that and then that, oh, no, that's actually not so good, sorry. This and then this and then that. This is equivalent to doing this and then this and then that. So what I've done here is this one has stayed in place, this one has stayed in place, and this middle strand, it was going to the left and then the right, now it's going to the right and then the left. But it's still between, it's still below this strand or behind this strand and in front of that strand. Okay? This, this sort of thing is easier to do with string than draw on the board, but do you see it? <laughs> Just grab this here and pull it that way, and it'll end up over here. So there's a nice theorem, which is that these three moves are all you need okay, to convert a knot into any other knot to which it's topologically equivalent. And in particular, if it's possible to untie a knot and to reduce it to a simple loop with no crossings at all, there exists a finite series of Riedemeister moves which will do this. So, <clears throat> so we could write down a bunch of problems now. So one would be not equivalence. <coughs> so the input would be two knots. And the question would be, um, and we should use some funny wiggly equals, are these two knots topologically identical? <coughs> so is there a sequence of moves which turns one into the other? This is an NP-ish question, because hidden in here is the usual statement, 
does there exist? A Hamiltonian path, a satisfying assignment, or whatever, except now it's a sequence of moves. Um, and then a particular case is um, called unknot, where the input is a single knot k, and this is just the special case of knot equivalence to the unknot, which looks sort of like that. So can k be untied completely without cutting it? By the way, I hope it's clear that when I say a knot here, the string is looped. Obviously, if the ends are free, you can pull it through and untie it. All right, so the problem, the reason why this is not obviously in NP, so one witness is, show me the sequence of moves. The problem is that if the sequence of moves is exponentially long, this is not something that you can show me or that I can check in polynomial time. And bizarrely enough, we still do not know that it is only polynomially long as a function of the number of crossings which I, I think that's amazing. I guess I strongly believe that a polynomial number of moves suffices, but no one has been able to prove this. This is not as deep as P versus NP, but it seems like a fun question. Um, so in case you're wondering what the best upper bound we know of, so the best upper bound on the number of moves to the CN where C is in the neighborhood of 10 to the 11. Presumably this is not the tightest possible upper bound, but it's the best we know. Okay, so, um, so <clears throat> just as in the case of primality, um, this sort of forces us to look for other witnesses, some other form of, of witness or proof that something can be untied. And again, I'm not gonna try to go into any of the topology, and I'm not really qualified to do so, but I think it's kind of neat. <coughs> so there's something called a Seifert surface. And the idea is if it's a surface whose boundary is the knot, so here's a simple knot. It can be untied. What surface has this as its boundary? Circle. Kind of circle. So what I mean is, so one thing that has this as its boundary <coughs> is like this. And these things are hard to draw on the computer or on the board. But it's a Mobius strip, right? And there has to be a twist there so that this loops back around and comes out here. Okay? But there's another surface which also has the same knot as its boundary, which is if you start out with something that looks like this, and then you know, think of this as a sheet of rubber, and then twist it around like that, and now fold this over in front of us. So now we have something that looks like this, but now this is solid and it sort of is folded over that way. Okay. Now there's a big difference between these two surfaces. They have the same boundary, but this one topologically is just a disk. If you took this and just let go, it would go if it's made of rubber and then you'd have a disc. So it turns out that another type of witness for a knot being an unknot, for a knot not being a knot, is a surface like this, which is topologically a disc. 
And it turns out that there are very clever ways of you set this up in three-dimensional space, you give the space a kind of mesh, a triangulation, and then what you do is you, um, it turns out that these, that these surfaces can, can themselves be highly folded but what you do is, in this picture of three-dimensional space, where you have these, you know, tetrahedra or whatever, you tell me how many times this surface intersects a given face on the tetrahedron. I, I have no idea how this works, by the way. I'm really just painting pictures here. But even if it intersects an exponential number of times, then there's a way to give me a witness using only order n bits at each place that topologically this whole surface, even with all these folds it has, is just a disk. Zowie. I mean, you know, gosh. I, uh, so I've told you everything I know about this. But I think it's very interesting that the most intuitive witness, we don't know how to use it to show that it's an NP, because the most intuitive witness, the list of moves that unties the knot, could be exponentially large, given what we currently know. And then there's this much more clever witness involving much more advanced topology, which gives us, what it does is it gives us a proof that the knot can be untied without telling us how. Uh -huh. Okay, that's what it does. And that's very interesting that, that's even, that such a thing is even possible. So remember on our very first day, we talked about one of these, you know, these sliding block puzzles where you have a bunch of wooden blocks and you have a space and you want to slide them around and you want to get this one down here or something. So this problem will turn out to be complete for a class high above NP. It'll turn out to be, I think I mentioned this before, P-space complete. Um, but it's conceivable that there's some funny way to prove to me that a solution to this puzzle exists, to prove that there exists a sequence of moves which slides this block all the way down here, but which doesn't show me the sequence. Some other less direct form of proof. And if that were the case, um, then P space would turn out to fall down to some lower complexity class, which we don't think is true, but we can't prove it, just like we can't prove that about NP. So, you know, the picture here is, it's a little bit less computational, it's a little bit more logical. It's about how hard is it to prove things as opposed to how hard algorithmically is it to find things. And it's asking, does there even exist a nice proof? And I, I just think it's fascinating that in, in some cases there are proofs which work in much less direct ways than we would think. I think it would be very strange to know that a knot can be untied without knowing how to, how to untie it. That would be a strange mental state to be in. Um, all right, well, so, um, I'm going to stop there today, let you out a little early. And um, what I'd like you to do, uh, so we're up through chapter four. I really, want, to, I really want, want you to read it. Don't forget any typos or larger scale comments on the understandability of a certain section um, will be remembered for as long as human civilization survives in the form of an acknowledgment in the preface, <laughs> um, maybe longer. And uh, then on Tuesday, we will start reading chapter five. So we'll really start getting into empty completeness. Any questions? All right. Yeah. Very good. Thank Thank you.